Hey guys, this is the next video in our ecology series. This one's going to be over community ecology. It's going to be a lot shorter than the first one. So let's step through it and make it good. So in video one, we talked about a population being the same species in the same place at the same time and, and all that. Now we're going to look at a community. So a community will be all of the organisms that live together in a particular place. And when we study community ecology, what we're really looking at are the interactions between those organisms with each other and also with the community, you know, the actual environment in which they're found. It's all about different things sharing a common environment. That's the commonality between them. Just a reminder, because I completely forgot to do this in the first video, at any point you can pause. It's a video. Like I said before, I'm not going to be waiting long periods of time for you to, to get notes down. I'm going to give you about a five second pause in between each slide. That's where you can pause the video, write down what you need to write down, and then press play again. So in terms of community structure, how, how everything's put together, we tend to have three main things. The first would be dominant species. So dominant species, just like the name suggests, will be the species that's the most abundant, has the highest biomass, you have, you know, lots of them. They have powerful control over the occurrence and distribution of another species. The next one is going to be a keystone species. And your keystone species, while it may not be the most abundant, it still does exert really strong control, and it's because of their ecological role or niche. A good example would be sea otters. Another one would be like prairie dogs. So they're normally smaller animals, but if you took them out, if you, if you removed them, it would completely break down that community. Then we always think of the richness of the community and not how wealthy the animals are, but instead we're talking about the number of species and the abundance. So a community that only has 10 species and not, you know, not very widespread wouldn't be a very rich community versus one that has 18 or 20 or 36 different species and you have a lot of individual organisms in each species. That community would be more rich than the, the, the one I previously described. And then, of course, we have to think of species diversity. So do we have lots of different kinds of animals or, or plants, all living, or bacteria, whatever, living in the same area? Okay, so that leads us to biodiversity. And uh, when we think of biodiversity, hopefully we're thinking of diverse life, because that's really what the name means. Communities with higher diversity tend to be more productive, but they also tend to be more stable in terms of their productivity. Okay, you have a lot of individuals contributing to the next generation. It's not all reliant on just one male and female mated pair or whatever. They're, be they're better able to withstand and recover from environmental stresses. They work together as a unit. They all help each other out. They take cues from each other, stuff like that. They also tend to be more resistant to invasive, spe to invasive species, organisms that don't really actually belong there, but somehow were brought in there. The more diverse your community, the more than likely something that lives there is going to be capable of dealing with an invasive species. Okay, so when we think of species diversity, we're literally looking at species richness plus the relative abundance of those individual organisms. And again, just to remind you, species richness um, refers to the number of different species that we have. Relative abundance is talking about the proportion of each different species represented by all of the individuals within the community. So relative abundance is normally very well displayed, like on a pie chart, for example. And we could look at, of our total community population, this much of it is made up of hooved animals. This much is made up of birds. This much is made up of reptiles. You know, stuff like that. <clears throat> um, ecologists use indices to quantify species diversity, to give it an actual number. Okay, and it's, it's a mathematical measurement. It's not something that we, we pay 
lots of attention to in AP Biology, but just know that there's a mathematical way to actually put a number to species diversity. So I used this word before, and this is one that you're probably familiar with from freshman biology, but the word niche refers to an organism's ecological role. Okay, so think of your habitat as your address, this is where I live, and your niche is your job. And your job is literally every single thing that you do that encompasses you, that makes you who you are. From what part of your habitat you live in, to who you interact with, to what you eat, to what color you you are, to if your dung helps to grow things for other people. Like every single thing that goes about helping you with or to do your job, that's considered your niche. So... When we talk about niches, we always have to link it to a term called competitive exclusion. And competitive exclusion is where two species literally compete for something that they have in common. So here's an example. Whoops, sorry. Hold on, let me shift this around a little bit. Let me get my laser. So here's an example of competitive exclusion. We have two species of, what are these? like clams. Let's just call them clams for right now. Um, and note that species one, okay, so here's how you have to look at this graph. Hopefully you can follow along as I anecdote this. Species one, which is this species of hair, technically can live from this region in high tide all the way down to that region. This is called its fundamental niche. If it's found there, it would be perfectly happy. It can exist there quite easily. It, it would be fine from this area all the way down to this area. Whereas species two is quite happy from this area down to that area. Let me put in some lines to, to make this a little bit more apparent. So here is species two and here is species one. So species one and species two share where they can extend down to, but where they can start extending from is different for both. So that would be the fundamental area. Fundamentally, if I could have any stretch of land that I want to, this is where I would exist if no one else bothered me. Then they have another niche, which is called the realized niche. And your realized niche is, okay, considering that I share this living space with other people, this is really where I have to live. It's not where I would love to live, but it's where I have to live. So think of it as I can afford this apartment even though it doesn't look ni as nice as this other apartment which I can't afford. So for species one, its realized niche is this region here. And for species two, it's from here to there. So notice there is some overlap right here in, in that area. So what has happened is if we took species two away, if we completely got rid of those clams, species one would extend from here all the way down because there's nothing here blocking it, okay? But at the lower depths, at this region of this cliff, species two outcompetes species one for this area, for this niche. Okay, so that's what competitive exclusion is. We have two species that are both competing for the same thing, and one of them is just a little bit better than the other, so they get first preference, and the other guy gets, what's, gets what is left. So hopefully that, that makes sense. So pretty much what competitive exclusion says is that no two similar species can occupy the same niche at the same time because they're going to out one of them is going to outcompete the other four resources. So a good example would be these two large cats, which are both very large predators, tiger over here, lion over here. <coughs> Excuse me. If you think about it, lots of similarities. Big cats, big paws, really powerful, kind of eat you know, game that's about the same size, so require a lot of food. But this guy's found in Asia only. This guy's found in Africa only. They are never going to meet. Because if they did meet, one of these would outcompete the other for that niche. Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we can go through and talk about the different kinds of competition that organisms can undergo, and it can be direct or indirect. So the first one is called interference, where they're, you're directly fighting over a resource. We're both fighting over this gazelle that I just killed. We're both fighting over the water in the watering hole. There is also exploitative, where it's indirectly competing for a limiting resource, like space, for example. Okay, so we're, we're going to just have to share the space and, and learn how to live with each other. There is a parent competition, which again is indirect, but it's indirect between two species that are both preyed upon by the same predator. Okay, so, you know, tigers like to eat both goats and sheep. The goats and the sheep are going to compete between each other so that, you know, someone's going to live and someone's going to die. That would be a parent competition. All right, so for example, species A and species B are both preyed on by predator C. The increase of species A will cause the decrease of species B because the increase of species A will increase the total number or increase the number of predator C's, which in turn will hunt more predator B's. So if you read this real slow and you picture it in your mind, it'll make sense, I promise. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll go over it in class. Okay, so the competitive exclusion principle, which is kind of what we, we talked about two slides ago, um, pretty much states that two species competing for the same resource cannot coexist if other ecological factors are constant. So if we don't change anything other than the resource that the two species are competing with, someone's going to die and someone's going to live. That's pretty much what this, this principle says. The competing species that has even the slightest advantage, and it could be slightly bigger teeth, or you run half a millisecond faster, that species is going to have an advantage and it will dominate in the long term over the species that doesn't have that advantage. One of two things will happen to the loser, the loser being the species that has a slight disadvantage or you know doesn't have the same advantage. They will either relocate to someplace else or they'll die and eventually become extinct. This principle can be paraphrased as complete competitors cannot coexist. We're competing for the same thing, we're pretty much evenly matched, Someone's going to have a slight advantage. Whoever has that advantage wins and can stay there. Who doesn't have the advantage either moves away or dies. So how do we fix the issue of competitive exclusion? It's genius. It's called resource partitioning. So we, we reduce the levels of competition or the amount of competition by having what we call microhabitats. So think of this as a high-rise apartment complex. We, don't, we live in the same area, but we don't necessarily have to see each other or utilize the same resources as long as I stick in my area and you stick to your area. So a good example of these or this would be these lizards, which are called anolis lizards, and they're um, native to the Caribbean, so we, we have tons of these where I come from. But what's kind of cool about them is even though they all live in this particular forest, l notice where. Okay, see how the names are kind of scattered all through the diagram? Where those names are tell you where those lizards live. So some of them live in the canopy of the trees. They never come down. They only stay in the canopy. Others live in this mid-region, what we call trunk lizards or twig lizards. They're only found in this mid-region. Others live actually on the ground or within the root systems of the, you know, these trees. But these guys don't go up, and these guys don't come down, and these guys just literally stay in the middle. Everything they need is in that location. Their food, their shelter, all of it, it's all there. So they never interfere, interact, or compete. Well, they do interact, but they don't compete with each other for those natural resources that all living things live. They all have a distinct niche, but it's within this habitat. So they have small regions of the habitat to themselves, hence the term microhabitats. Okay. 
Okay, so this I know you're familiar with. We can, we're now going to get into um, the symbiotic re relationships or interactions that animals go through. So I'm literally going to run through these and not spend a whole lot of time on them. So symbiotic relationships are how it, organisms interact with each other. And there's competition where your two things are competing, or, or more things, two or more things, are competing for a limited resource. Then we have predation and parasitism. In predation, one animal is literally going to go kill another animal for food, whereas in parasitism, one animal is using another as a host. It doesn't mean to kill the animal, but sometimes the animal does die, but that's not the, that's not the goal. Then there's mutualism, where both organisms in that relationship are going to benefit from ha having a relationship with each other. And then there's commensalism, where one organism benefits and the other one isn't affected. It's not harmed, it's not helped, it's just there. It's no big deal. So, symbiotic interactions. All right, and just here are some examples of animals that, that do these different interactions. These are bryophytes, or types of trees that types of plants, sorry, that sit on top of trees so that they can get closer to sunlight. Um, this would be predation here where the spider is killing this butterfly. We have competition where one bird is trying to have another bird take care of her young. When this egg hatches, it's going to kill or compete with these babies for food. There's mutualism where both of them are going to benefit from this relationship. So just some examples. Okay, so we have a saying in biology and it goes that predation drives evolution and it's because predation forces you to adapt predators are going to adapt for to changes in their prey and prey are going to adapt to changes in the predators predators adaptions tend to be ones that will help them to locate prey like great eyesight or great a great sense of smell and also ones that help them to subdue prey so they move very quickly or they have really long claws or really sharp teeth. Whereas prey adaptions are going to be things that help that prey to survive longer. So things that allow you to elude. You might run faster. You might run in a zigzag pattern or to defend yourself. Okay, You have long claws or, or sharp teeth or you can fly or, or whatever. So things that help you to survive one more day, in other words. Because we say that it drives evolution, it's because predation is what we call a strong selector or a strong selector pressure for predator or prey. This just means that if you don't adapt, if you can't make these changes, if you can't live long enough to reproduce, you die. And those genes that didn't help you to reproduce, they kind of fizzle out with you. Whereas the organisms that do have that, that extra advantage that allows them to stay alive long enough to survive and reproduce, they pass that ability on to their offspring and their genes. So it is a strong selective pressure for what in this situation is fit versus unfit. What can survive long enough versus not survive long enough. Okay, so what are some of these adaptations? Some of them are actually kind of cool. Well, the first one is you can hide from your predators. If you can avoid detection, they can't see you, they can't eat you. Classic example would be camouflage. So like our little lizard friend right there. Then you can try to warn your predators. Hey, you know what? I really don't taste good or I'm kind of poisonous. It probably wouldn't do you a whole lot of good if you tried to eat me. So I'm going to advertise that some way. I'm going to make... have have really bright colors or really distinctive spots or really distinctive patterns that let you know that eating me, really bad idea. So the term we use for this, this ability to warn predators through color is called aposematic coloration. And apo means away and somatic means sign, so sign that tells you go away. And there are two kinds of mimicry that fall in line with this kind of coloration. And we'll, we'll step through what those are in a few slides. Okay, so going back to the defense mechanisms, like I said, there's camouflage. And one of the classic kinds is what we call cryptic camouflage, where you, you really just blend in. Like if, if it was a quick glance, whatever is trying to eat you may not see you because you just blend in so very well with those surroundings. So here is a whippoorwill, which is a type of bird. Here is a lizard, 
that's right there some kind of frog or toad here's another frog and our lizard friend from the picture before but if you are looking at these animals from on top or from a, a, a bit further away than how they're positioned it would be very hard to see them okay then we have mimicry and there are two kinds Batesian mimicry <clears throat> is where a harmless species mimics a harmful species so there's nothing really wrong with you. If that predator ate you, they'd be perfectly fine. They might even like you and try to eat more of you. But you, imi you imitate something that really is poisonous or dangerous, trying to warn that predator off. So a good example is the hawk, <coughs> excuse me, the hawk moth lava, that's a, a mouthful, and the green parrot snake. Green parrot snakes are very poisonous. And when ingested, they make the um the predator really really sick sometimes to the point where they can kill them well even though this guy's a lot smaller than this guy there are some some very distinct similarities between the two so what our little larva friend here is going to do is he is going to take an air and puff himself up and rear his head up so that he looks like this snake and that is normally enough to warn off anything like any kind of bird that's trying to eat him Okay, then another example would be butterflies. So monarch butterflies are very, very poisonous. And one of the ways you can tell that you're looking at a monarch butterfly is because they have this eye spot at the lower part of their tail. There is another kind of butterfly called a viceroy butterfly that isn't poisonous at all. Note, no eye. Well, he has eye spots, but his eye spots are all connected. But there, again, at quick glance, there are some definite similarities between the two. So by imitating this guy in terms of coloration and size, chances are he'll live a little bit longer. There are also some kinds of moths that try to imitate different kinds of bees so that they look, you know, like they're more poisonous than, than they really are. It's just a way of fooling the person trying to eat you or the thing trying to eat you. Okay, the next kind of mimicry is called Mullerian mimicry where you have two or more protected species that look like each other. Um, so an example here would be the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket. Again, fairly dangerous, not as dangerous, but does a good job of impersonating the yellow jacket. One of the things ecologists have noticed is that aposomatic species tend to resemble each other. All of these, whoops, Sorry, hold on. Okay, try that again. All of these guys are poisonous. Look at the colors. We see a repeated pattern of that yellow and white and black and orange. Um, some different patterns, but it's definitely all the same colors being used over and over again. The thought process being, if predators get used to associating these colors with an animal that can make them sick or potentially kill them, they tend to leave all animals colored that particular color alone. All right, so here's mimicry again. This is a king snake, not poisonous. Coral snake, definitely poisonous. This would be an example of your Batesian mimicry. Oh, sorry. Okay, so what you should, hopefully you're picking up on the pattern that there is a lot of co-evolution taking place in a community. Predator and prey are going to co-evolve together. Predator getting adaptions that help adaptation, sorry, that help them to catch prey better or easier. Prey getting adaptations that allow them to elude or defend themselves from predators easier. But they're going to evolve together because it the the evolution selection process involves both of them. We can see the same thing with parasites and hosts. Um, organisms. We can see the same thing with flowers and pollinators. As the flowers change shape, what can pollinate them also changes. And once you find a good pollinator, both of you tend to evolve together at the same time. And that's called co-evolution. And it tends to be a community trait. Okay, so it's just these little adjustments. One thing makes an adjustment, and the other thing that depends on that first organism makes another adjustment, and they just keep going. 
don't forget that organisms, the individuals, aren't the ones ev evolving. When we talk about coevolution, we're talking about the species as a whole, or the population sometimes as a whole. Okay, guys, we've already had this slide, so we're just going to keep rolling through. All right, so let's talk about ecological or ecological succession. So succession should make you think of sequence. And ecological succession is the sequence of changes within a community, how a community adjusts or develops or transitions over time. And when we talk about time in biology, it's almost like talking about time in geology. It means a long time. We're talking about decades, sometimes hundreds and thousands of years. You normally see ecological succession in one of two ways. An area that has never had soil before, developing soil, and then all of the changes that take place after that, or an area that used to be fairly abundant in terms of a community and had some kind of disturbance you know, an earthquake, a flood, uh, something like that, volcano erupting, and now it's coming back after that disturbance. Okay, so there are two kinds. There's primary succession, and primary succession literally starts with nothing. There, there's no soil. There's like some kind of barren rock, but no actual soil. So primary succession is all about making soil. And it starts off with what we call our pioneer species, the very first things that are going to live there and contribute to the making of soil. And in this case, or in all cases, it's normally bacteria and primitive lichens or mosses. From there, once, once the bacteria and the lichens die, then they become part of the soil. They help to put nutrients into the soil. And now that soil can support bigger life, like grasses. When the grass dies, it goes into the soil, its nutrients get recycled, and now you can support bigger organisms like shrubs and then eventually trees. So primary succession, the key thing with primary succession is the fact that we start off virtually lifeless. There's no soil. We have to actually make soil. Secondary succession is the second kind of ecological succession, and it's what happens when an existing community is destroyed or cleared. But the soil itself, the, er, the, the base soil, is left intact. So a fire, a flood, a volcano erupted, an earthquake, um, a human decides it just wants to completely cut down a field because it, they want to plant something there. All of those would be examples under which secondary succession would take place. We're getting rid of the life, but the soil itself stays. So... When that happens, if left alone, succession is going, to re is going to start all over again. But this time it's going to be faster because we don't have to make soil. So instead of doing all of that, we can just start with our grass and our shrubs and then eventually our trees. It's a faster process the second time. All right, so just an example of succession. So we're going to start off with our pioneer species. That will be our bacteria, our lichens, and mosses. They're going to kind of start making soil and start adding some nutrients to the ground. And then we're going to have some grass grow. process is going to repeat itself. Notice that as succession takes place, we start making taller and bigger organisms, in this case, um, plants. And it's because grasses and some of these shorter plants need a lot of sunlight. So it's, it's best to grow them early because there's nothing there to compete with them for the sunlight. Then once they've established themselves, some of what we, what we call our shade tolerant species, our larger trees and shrubs can start growing because they don't need as much sunlight and this population is already established and, and that kind of thing. When we have a situation where we're growing all varieties and all different kinds of plants, we have animals living there and it's a stable community, we call that our climax forest. So our climax forest is where we have lots of diversity and a stable community. So what causes succession? Well, tolerance, first of all. Um, Early species tend to be are selected. You make lots of them, and you don't take very good care of them, and you hope for the best. 
They tend to be t more tolerant of harsh conditions and they bounce back very easily. Then there is facilitation and inhib inhibition. The early species is only there to make the habitat better, to facilitate the changes that the habitat needs so that it can start supporting lots more diverse and bigger life. So changing the pH of the soil, changing the fertility of the soil, changing the amount of light that filters through and gets everywhere in that area. This also, I forgot to mention, sorry, this also allows for some competitive exclusion. Some species are going to outcompete those species and those species that don't have an advantage, and those are the ones that you want to survive. Those are the ones that you want making up your climax forest because they tend to be more stable. Okay, so again, the climax forest, like I mentioned before, is a plant community that's dominated by trees, large trees, and they represent the final stage of natural succession for a particular area. Once you've made a climax forest or once a climax forest has grown, that is the most stable that that community can be at. It tends to remain unchanged for a really long time as long as you don't have some of those natural disasters that we talked about. Right, and here's just an example of different kinds of, of climax forests. This is the Taiga where it gets pretty cold and the ground is permanently frozen. So you see some like Christmas tree looking types of trees. This is deciduous, temperate deciduous forests, some of which that you have in the United States, especially Canada. Canada gets um, associated with this orange and maple color, especially in the fall time a lot. Okay, then we also have what we call fire climax species. And that is an actual adaptation. And it's an adaptation to survive and reproduce in areas that experience frequent fires. Like some parts of California have lots of plant species that are fire resistant. Or they, they only grow best in soils that have been fired. Or they can only produce their cones or their seeds um, when they themselves have undergone fire. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, that's the end of it. I kept clicking and, and nothing happened. So this is it for community ecology. Hopefully this was, was shorter and more compact. Again, come with your questions to class, um, and we can address them for a little bit. See you soon.